Wonderful. We can just welcome everybody here. We're just so glad that you're here. Where else could you be besides here just to feel the warmth of family and friends? Again, we're so welcome. Again, just we're glad as really, I don't know how many leaves will be left after the last couple of days of wind and rain. Fall goes so quickly. But just a few reminders. Don't forget, following the service, we do have our Sunday school class downstairs. We are youth group Wednesday for 12, starts at 6. That's for middle and high school, junior high, high school. Then we have kick at 6.30 for our younger kids. Wednesday, we're starting a whole new series. So maybe you're sitting back and say, you know, I was going to go to the Bible study on Wednesday night, but you were already halfway through the book of James. If you don't catch the beginning, it's not going to make any sense at the end. Well, that's not true. But we're going to start a new series on the book of Ephesians. You're all invited. It's just a wonderful time with just good people just sitting here and just studying God's word. So that's Wednesday at 6.30. Don't forget Thursday, 5 to 7, is our trunk or treat. If it rains, I guess we'll go downstairs. Who knows what the weather's going to be like, so prepare for that. But it is here, plus everything else that's going on. It's kind of a neat thing Algon Act does. Don't forget today, Detroit Red Wings celebrate faith. I have to tell a little story here of... <laughs> my mistakes in life sometimes but as we're getting this all organized and more people wanted tickets and these kind of things finally got it all organized Kristen is the person I've been working through just a wonderful wonderful girl that's hey I need more tickets that's fine I need more tickets that's fine and finally she says I'm gonna mail you the tickets and they'll be here Friday I said fine so Friday was just so completely I'm getting bombarded with different things I miss the UPS so I get it. I'm going, oh my goodness. I call him. Oh, yeah, we'll send him Monday. I said, Monday's not going to work for me. <laughs> so they said, wait a minute. UPS is still in Algonac. I said, can you give me his number? So I find a guy. I get his number. I find him. I get his tickets. Well, I get a box here. So here's the box. I sign it. Yes. I throw it in the back of my truck. I'm cool. Go to the football game. I have so much stuff. In the morning, we're running around. I knew people were going to start calling for tickets saying that we're not going to be riding the party bus. So I open that box up to get the tickets. It's not the tickets. It's a book from somewhere else. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I look back in the door. There's a different sticker from FedEx. So now I'm trying to call FedEx. It's too late. We're closed. There's nothing we can do. So now I'm really kind of panicking a little bit. So I call K Kristen. And I call her, and she's not answering, and I'm leaving messages, and I'm calling, I'm looking up the red room, can I call somebody in? I'm calling the ticket place, and they're like, what, I, we don't know what you're talking about. Just, what am I going to, I know, I said, God, I know it's going to work. Well, she finally calls me, and this is how great God is. And she says, no, we'll work this out, it's no problem. Just when you come in, I'll meet you when you come in, and we'll have all the tickets for the people that are there. Those who are going early, they'll be at will call. And she said... I've had the worst day today. And we started talking. And we prayed together. And it was like I was having, you know, here I was having a problem with patience. And God said, there's a reason for everything. She said, I was just having a problem with trust and stuff. And just all of a sudden, this talk and this different thing. And I'm going, thank you, God. Because now I see how his plans sometimes just fall into place, even though we think it's uh, some kind of inconvenience or trick. God said, I'm going to make this good. And he made it good. And so I'm so excited again to, to be here tonight and with everybody going to the game. Don't forget, so we started a new series called The Fruit of the Spirit. And today we're going to be talking about the tree of goodness. And again, we're going to be in Galatians 5, 22 for 23. We've been there quite a bit. In talking about this, but the big question today is, the Bible tells us that we should strive for goodness in our lives, but Jesus said no one was good except God. So the question is, how can we be asked to do something that only God can accomplish? As we go to our scripture again in Galatians 5, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. I heard of a preacher one time who said that the people in his congregation got into the habit as he stood at the door as they left and would always tell them, 
Now you be good, preacher. And he got to think about it, and he began to respond when somebody says, now be good, and he said, his response became, in my profession, it's hard to be anything else. And I had to think about that, because it's kind of true. Being in this position here, you people expect me to be good. Not only that, you might even say you pay me to be good. <laughs> now, in contrast, you people are really good for nothing. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> God has always wanted his people to be good. He places such a high priority on it that he repeatedly requests and commands that his people do just that. For example, in Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In John's third letter, it says, Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God, and anyone who does what is evil has not see God. Romans 2 says, God will repay each person according to what they have done. For those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, they, there will be wrath and anger, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. As I was preparing this sermon, I came across a story in Matthew and a man came up to him and said, Teacher, what good things must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus replied, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. Well, now I'm confused. I'm really confused. In one place I'm told that God wants me to be good. But then as I read in Matthew, it says... Jesus says there's only one who is good, and that is God. In fact, Romans 3.10 tells us there is no one righteous, not even one. No one. No one is inherently good, and there's no one who is basically righteous. I don't know if you know the story of Louis XIV of France. He died in 1715, ruled France for 72 years, which is still a record for any king. 72 years he ruled France. And he called himself great. He called himself the Sun King. He even said at one point when they were talking about the kingdom, he said, I am the state. His court was unbelievable. And his funeral was just as spectacular. And as his body laid in state in a almost solid gold coffin, orders were given in the huge cathedral. And, it should, and they said I want, they wanted it, his orders to have it dimly lit, except for one candle, a special candle above the coffin to dramatize how great he was. And as the funeral began, Thousands sat there in silence. And when the bishop came to give the eulogy for this king, he walks up to the candle, licks his fingers, and puts it out and says, Only God is great. And he was exactly right. Only God is great. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if that's true, if we've all sinned, as it says in Romans 3.23, then none of us are inherently good or righteous. And the question now is, why do many people think of themselves as basically good? Let me ask you this question. How many people, you know, love going to the DMV to get your license? And how many look at that picture and go, that is probably the finest picture I've ever taken. You almost want to go back and say, could you blow this up for me? <laughs> Can I get about a half a dozen five by tens? I want to hand them out to my, my friends. That's not really the case, as you know. A lot of people don't even like to show that. The 
problem is, is when we go there, it's not one of those glamour shots where they let you get ready, make sure everything's set. It's not happening that way. They're not experts in taking your picture. They just take the picture. And the problem isn't in the picture. It's really in us. I was reading where a well-known photographer who did a lot of the stars and a lot of these people, and he said, there are very few truly beautiful women and men in this world. He said, when I'm doing these pictures, there's a lot of touch-up going on on those pictures. And I guess you can get that on your phones now when you take pictures, because Brenda will show me some of these pictures of friends of high or something. I go, man, they look really good. Now they can touch those up a, a little bit. They can take those flaws away. Unfortunately, though, when we look into the mirror, we're usually engaged in some type of activity. Either you're shaving or you're brushing your teeth, combing your hair. And you get deceived a little bit because you're in motion. And you really don't catch the flaws if you're in motion. But when we become still, as in a photograph, undesirable features become obvious to us. When you really sit and look at, whoa, I look like that? You see, what the Bible teaches us is we have flaw in our own souls. And when we just stop for a moment and become still, if we just sit down long enough to examine our lives and meditate on the things that we've said, meditate on the things that maybe we've done in our lives, and it might be just over this past week, we eventually see the, our own flaws within ourselves. Because there are things we've thought and said and done to those around us. It makes us kind of sink into shame a little bit because the flaws become apparent. Because we have a defect that would make us less appealing to God, we call this sin. Now the Bible isn't saying we can't do good things. It's not saying that at all. What the Bible is saying is that sinfulness that resides within us taints the flavor, really, of the good deeds that we do. I like the story of a well-known Christian businessman who was visiting the church and was asked to give his testimony. And so he comes up and he says, I'm glad to be here. I just wanted to let everybody know that I have a fine family. And I live in a very, very large house. My business is so successful. And I have a tremendous reputation, not only in this town, but almost throughout the state. He says, I have plenty of money, and I can support so many different Christian ministries. Many organizations throughout the state want me on their board of directors. I have my health, and I almost have unlimited opportunities. What more could I ask from God? And somebody in the back spoke up and says, how about asking for just a little bit of humility? <laughs> No matter how good we are in this life, we still need Jesus Christ. I think at least part of our problem sometimes is that we're so prideful. We want to believe in ourselves. We want to believe in our own ability to accomplish things for ourselves. It's like when the little kids become two or three, they want to dress themselves. They want to do this themselves because they feel that they can. We become the same. It seems like that just carries over. And we put that same concept with God. I got this, God. Sit off to the side. And that's not how it's supposed to work. But when it comes to eternity, everything, when it comes to eternity, everything depends on Jesus and as little on us. Our trust must be in him. Not in ourselves, and not in our own goodness. You see, our sins ruin the flavor of our good deeds. Sin makes whatever goodness we have in us become warped and deformed and weak. I like how one guy put it. He said, God formed us, sin deformed us, but the good news is Christ can transform us. That's the good news of Galatians chapter 5. God doesn't say we'll be filled with goodness because we're nice people. It doesn't work that way. God says we'll be filled with goodness because we're filled with his spirit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. 
In other words, as long as I'm walking in the Spirit, these fruits will grow continually in my life. If I'm walking in the Spirit of Jesus, then I will produce a good crop. And since we're talking about the fruits of the Spirit, you got to understand, I love fruit. I eat fruit all the time. Each morning, I get up and I make my smoothie with my blueberries and my bananas. And a little trick I've been doing, I read, and it might be wrong, but I, I blend the peel as well as the whole banana. They said there's something in the peel that makes you feel better. I don't know. <laughs> but nonetheless, every morning with my little almond milk, and I enjoy this. And I'm going to take these fruits here, and I'm going to have them represent the fruit of the Spirit that we just read about in Galatians. And the Bible tells me that these fruits must grow in my life. And so, the, the next, you know, this is what I'm going to do the next morning because this is supposed to be the fruits of my life. So tomorrow when I get up and I'm prepared to make my smoothie, I'm going to put all the fruit there on my counter and I'm going to tell them to grow, produce more fruit. I want more blueberries. Will you please produce more blueberries for me right now? I could use maybe four more bananas would help because Jacqueline likes the smoothies as well before she goes. And I could yell at these fruits all day long. Nothing is going to happen. Why? Because they're not on the vine or on the branches anymore. Jesus said, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither you can bear fruit unless you remain in me. What is Jesus telling us here? If I want to have the kind of goodness that God desires in my life, I must remain in Jesus. I must get close to him. His thinking has become my thinking. I got to get close to him that I produce the fruit that pleases him. So how do I produce this kind of crop or fruit that pleases him? Let's go back together and look at what it says in Luke 6, 43 through 45. It says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So producing good fruit means that I must store up the good inside of me and the good inside of my heart. But the question is, how do I do that? How do I produce these things? Well, let me tell you. The first thing that we have to do, the number one thing that we have to do, you're doing it right now. You're sitting here in God's house worshiping him. That's the first thing we need to do if we want to have that spirit in our heart. If we want that goodness, it starts here and learning more about it. Hebrews 10 tells us, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. God designed a church to be a place where we challenge and encourage each other to do good things for Jesus Christ. My job is to challenge you from up here. My job is to encourage you from up here. My job is to make you think. My job here is to teach. But a church really, truly grows when you people in this body of believers within this group, when you people start to encourage each other to serve, to go to each other and pray for each other, to be willing to help each other. These are the things that makes us grow. These are the things that we develop and how we develop this fruit of the Spirit. We all should look at the good qualities of each other. We all should be the good finders for each other because there's untapped potential throughout this room that's unbelievable. 
We need to encourage. We need to challenge. If you're part of a group, ask some other people to be part of that group. If you have ideas, come with me and start something. We can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives us strength. The second thing, 2 Timothy says, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need to constantly find ways to expose ourselves to God's word. Besides being here, and thank you so much. I love seeing you people. But I'd also love to see people stay a little bit, to get to go a little more. We have an excellent Sunday school down. Says they've been doing a lot of great tapes. I think tonight, if today, this morning, you're finishing up on the Holy Spirit, I think is where they've been talking about. Wednesday night, 6.30, we just sit here and we just study God's word. There's personal Bible study time. Get to know your Bible. Take that time to do this. The Bible is meant to be a bread for daily use, not cake for special occasions. I like when one person says, the Bible in hand is worth two on the shelf. The Bible helps us to do good things because it changes how we think. I thought this was pretty interesting. A few years back, the state of Kentucky had a law that said every classroom in the public school system had to post the Ten Commandments. Well, it was brought to court, and the Supreme Court ruled against the state of Kentucky, ordering them to take down all the copies of the Ten Commandments in all the classrooms. And this is what the Supreme Court said. I love this. It says, having the commandments on the wall may induce a student to read them, meditate upon them, and actually obey what's written on them. I had to read that again. I'm going, and help me on this one. Where is this wrong? Look what's happened in our own school systems over the last 20, 15 years. Because God has been taking out of the public school system the cheating, the drugs, the bullying, the crime. And everybody wants to wonder why. We don't know what's going on. We can do all these things. But they miss the point of how important it is to have God in part of our world. Because the world is not as it was intended to be. It's been spoiled. and often seems to be growing worse each and passing year. The problem is sin and the solution is simple. It's God. It's God. Going back to our story here. As it said, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? This is a question you don't see very many people ask. Because a lot of people are really not interested in eternal life. Because if they're talking about eternal life, that means they've got to die. And people don't want to talk about being dead. And so it's something that they really don't want to talk about. More people are just interested in the here and now. And I found this story, and I thought it was pretty interesting. I don't know if you know who Vince Lombardi is. If you watch the Super Bowl, it's the trophies named after him. And way back when he was coaching, when they weren't making a lot of money, the players, one of his players, Max McGee, broke curfew, which was at 11 o'clock. And so he snuck out, and the following day they had a meeting, and Vince fined him $125 for sneaking out past curfew and promised if you do it again, it will be $250. Well, he was caught again. And Vince was just, uh, he was upset. And he said, do it again, it's going to be $500. And Max sure loved life, and he didn't scare easily. Inevitably, at the next meeting, he was caught, and Lombardi was shaking mad. I mean, he said, Max, that will cost you $500. And if you do it again, it's going to cost you $1,000. The room just came to a real quiet as all the players were sitting there. And Lombardi kind of calmed down a little bit and with a grin he said, Max, if you can find something worth sneaking out that's going to cost you $1,000, call me, I'll go with you. <laughs> there are many things in life that people sneak off to do. Let me rephrase that, not sneak off to do. There are many things that people boldly and boastfully 
go off and do. And they do it regardless of the cost. They don't care. Some people have forfeited their entire lives for the things of this world. For many people, the things of this world are far more attractive than what they think God can offer them. And you can name it, and it keeps people away from God, money, fame, careers, sports, pleasure. You can name it. Someone once said, worldlessness is what makes sin look normal in any age, and righteousness to seem odd. See, worldliness has warped us, has warped our thinking, and has warped our ways. God's word changes our thinking. God's word changes our ways. God's word fills our hearts, and it makes us better people. And the more we expose ourselves to God's prescription written in the book, the more of Christ's goodness will enter into our hearts and into our lives. Now the value of Christ's goodness rather than my own abiding in my heart is that goodness will bear fruit. It's a goodness that will last when we give it to God. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's handiwork, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has prepared good things for us to do. God has prepared those things in advance for us to do. There are good things which he knows will have a lasting effect beyond anything that our moral efforts could ever accomplish. Using an example out of the book of Acts, there's a story of Barnabas, and it says in 1120, he was a good man, full of Holy Spirit and faith, and had a great number of people who were brought to him. He brought many, many people to the Lord. It wasn't Barnabas' great doctrine that drew people to Jesus, even though the doctrine was impeccable. And it wasn't his speaking style that drew large crowds God. What drew people to Jesus was the fact that Barnabas was a good man. And Barnabas did good things. And because he was a man whose goodness was driven by the Holy Spirit, people came to know God. Jesus said this, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I love the story of a, a little girl on her way home from church. And she said to her mother, Mommy, the preacher's sermon this morning confused me. And the mom said, Really? What is it? And the little girl said, Well, he said that God is bigger than we are. Is that true? The mom said, Yes, of course that's true. And the little girl said, he also said that God lives within us. Is that also true? And the mother said, yes, that is also true. Well, said the little girl with a confused look on her face, if God is bigger than us and he lives in us, wouldn't he just show through? Wouldn't he just show through? Because God is so big. And if we allow him to live within our heart, God will show through through. When God dwells solidly within us by our constant fellowship with each other and by our constant exposure to his word, then he begins to show through in everything we do and everything we say. This is how we know we produce the kind of fruit God desires in our lives. But fruit needs to be attached to the vine or the tree to grow. And if you don't belong to Jesus right now, you will not be able to produce the quality of goodness that you really want in your life. But I want you to remember this. Think about this. There's a window of opportunity. There's a window of opportunity for each of us. You see, God in his grace opens a window for all of us. All of us. God gives each and every one of us an opportunity of a lifetime. A chance to take our meager resources and mix it with his abundance. The prospect 
think about this. The prospect of partnering with him can be the greatest adventure of our lives. It's mind-boggling if we think about it. It's mind-boggling what we can accomplish as a group of believers when we combine our little resources with his abundance. It's mind-boggling exactly what this group of believers could accomplish when we start producing the kind of fruit that God wants us to produce. But the question also is, how long will that window stay open? How long will that window stay open? Nobody knows. But I'll guarantee you this, it will expire. And on that great day of reckoning that is to come, that is to come, when all accounts are finally settled and all the questions that you might have are completely answered, the only word sadder than if only will be too late. Too late. The only way to be part of Jesus Christ is to attach yourself to to him. God's love for us has been demonstrated not only in the sacrificial death of his son, but in this. Romans 5.5 5 says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into the hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts so that we can personally experience our lives today knowing that we're producing good fruit. Moreover, we have to internalize God's love for us. Then we can choose to act in His goodness and understand God's goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can choose to act in the best interest of each other. This is what it says when we become Christians, when we enter the waters of baptism so we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, what is that gift going to do for us? It's going to help us produce the fruit that we need to produce. We're going to see things differently because now we'll have the eyes of Jesus. We have the comfort of the Holy Spirit to guide us. And we're going to see things different. We're going to look at people different because now we have a heart of goodness. And because we have that heart of goodness and kindness and patience and love, it's amazing what can happen. And the best part is, as a group of believers, we can see that tree of goodness continue to grow here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear precious Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. You are so good. You have allowed us to be here today. We just ask for those who are believers, those who have accepted you, please, dear Heavenly Father, we know that you're in us. Let that Holy Spirit just reign throughout us. Let it guide our steps. Let it guide our thoughts. Let it guide our hearts, dear Heavenly Father. Sometimes we are so weak and so confused, but we know we can take these things to you, and we thank you for that. Give us wisdom, dear Heavenly Father. Give us courage. Give us strength as we go throughout each day. Let us be that walking example for you. Let people see you through us. Let us have your eyes and your ears and your heart, dear Heavenly Father. Let this congregation come together like it's never come before, to work together for the benefit of you. Let us spread throughout this community and show them the power that you have. We just thank you so much for that power. But more than anything, we thank you for the love. We thank you for the promise for those who believe in you, who accept you. You give us eternal life. That's the good news. That's the message. And we thank you for that. It's your name that we pray. Amen.